morning, everyone, from here in London and also uh, here in Cambridge in the UK. Good morning, good evening from wherever you are joining us from. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on the role of artificial intelligence in the telecom sector and how AI will transform the market at large and all the industries it touches. Today's session is brought to you by Cambridge Consultants, the uh, research and development firm headquartered in Cambridge and spread across the globe. Uh, and it's brought to you in association with RCR Wireless and Enterprise IoT Insights. My name is James Blackman. I edit Enterprise IoT Insights. I will cha chair today's session. I have with me Derek L Dr. Derek Long, Head of Telecoms and Mobile at Cambridge Consultants, and Monty Barlow, Head of AI at Cambridge Consultants. Derek, Monty, great to have you with us. Uh, just before Thank I you. hand Thank over, you, James. Okay, just before I hand over, I would just like to take a moment to set the scene and provide some context here. Um, as you know, as you will all know, there is, there is massive disruption in the telecom space at the moment, driven primarily by the shift from proprietary to commoditized hardware and by the, the virtualization of network functions in software. And we are seeing this in the core of the network, the radio network, and at the uh, network's edge. Uh, the idea, of course, is it's supposed to get simpler with uh, SDN and NFV, but the reality is it isn't getting simpler, it's getting harder and more complicated. And it is just uh, like a virtualized chaos instead. Uh, 5G G and IoT are suppo supposed to create a once in a generation opportunity for this sector to reinvent itself, to target new verticals like cities and manufacturing with ultra reliable low latency communications made bespoke for, for industry and new customers by features like network slicing. But this rising chaos is threatening to stop that. More needs to be done if wireless networks are to be trusted by industry to support their most sensitive and most critical systems and services, which is where AI comes in. If operators can manage the chaos, they can get out of this spiral, move from commoditized services to value added services. That is the message today, that AI is the key to change for the telecoms industry. And more than this, the message is that the telecoms industry's take on AI is key for other industries as well. Uh, but for that, the quality of experience has to be better. The, this kind of best effort service available to enterprises and industries today will not cut it in the future. A best of effort service dictated by the, uh, the quality of the signal to the device is not acceptable for driverless cars, is not acceptable for high-end manufacturing, or security of these, of these industrial systems. It is not acceptable for any of these new industries the telecom, telecom sector wants to serve. Uh, 5G promises ultra-reliability, but this will only be achieved with AI. So that is the scene, that is what is at stake. This is where we uh, start today's session. Just before I hand over to Cambridge Consultants, some minor housekeeping. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded and both the audio and the slides will be available afterwards on the RCR and the Enterprise IT Insights websites. As well, a Q&A session will follow the main presentation, so there will be plenty of opportunity to ask questions of the panel. Uh, you should be able to see a, a Q&A dialogue box on your screen, so please feel free to ask questions as they arise during the presentation and we will look to come back to them. Uh, okay, right, so without further ado, I would like now to hand over to Cambridge Consultants and to Dr. Derek Long, Head of Telecoms and Mobile, and Monty Barlow, Head of AI at Cambridge Consultants. I believe Derek, you're up first. Guys, over to you. Okay. Great, thanks very much, James, and thanks for your uh, kind words of introduction there. So, moving right along. So. Just um, here's a picture of uh, Monty and myself. Uh, my name is Derek Long. I head up the uh, telecommunications um, practice here at Cambridge Consultants. So I deal with all business and all customers that we have, you know, from operators and the supply chain 
leading into operators. And uh, my colleague Monty here, he heads up the um, uh, artificial intelligence development capability that we have, and I'll describe a little bit more about that later on. So a brief introduction to, um, uh, to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, <clears throat> so the presentation is really divided up into, into three components. We'll start off with uh, an overview of the, the status and let's say what still can, is still to be done with the introduction of artificial intelligence into telecommunications. Then look at a case study uh, where we've been looking at um, uh, you know, how to uh, provide a high quality radio connectivity for a industrial IoT setting and the challenges and the potential solutions that there are in that environment. Um, and then we'll look at some of the, the more advanced technologies that we've been developing here at Cambridge Consultants uh, in order to enable that in, and their application in both telecommunications and also in other industries as well. So just a few brief words about who Cambridge Consultants is um, and what makes us different here. So as I'm assuming that many of you may not have heard of us before, we are a um, independent product design and technology consultancy. Uh, we work with um, a number of advanced technologies in different markets. Um, what makes us different from other consultancies is we develop technologies and products uh, quite uh, simply. Uh, we also uh, perform strategy, tech, particularly technology strategy work um, in that area. But it's this, the fact that we actually go and develop um, things which are either you know, hard to do or not being done before, which puts us and keeps us at the forefront of technology development. Um, just a brief fact about the, the company, we're 800 staff and we're spread around the globe. <clears throat> um, the vast majority of these people are engineers and scientists and we have been in existence since the early 1960s, so we have a good um, pedigree uh, of working with, so let's say, all kinds of, um, of clients. These could be small startups um, all the way up until to global blue chips. We have a, 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 an expertise in the development and in the um, execution of large multidisciplinary projects so we can look across a number of different technology types and combine them into um, you know, projects which, which large blue chip companies are, um, are typically interested in. Just a brief word about the locations that we are based in. As you can see here, we're in seven main locations around the globe. Um, our um, just over half of our employees are based in Europe and in Asia, and the other half of, uh, or just under half, are based in North America in these four main sites uh, that you can see here. Um, probably with uh, Boston and Seattle being being our major locations on in this in North American market. So, um, <clears throat> if we look at the uh, you know, as James described in his introduction, there's a lot happening in the telecommunications industry at the moment. There is a lot of, um, a lot of disruption, there's a lot of innovation. Uh, there is a, um, um, you know, it's not only AI, it's 5G, it's uh, you know, the, in, you know, the shift from uh, hardware to software and uh, the commoditization of hardware and, and so on, and all the many initiatives that are going around in that space. Um, when we look at, um, uh, and yet, despite all of that, innovation that we can see I think it is you could make a claim that actually in terms of the the application and the use of that new, new technology there are other industries which are more advanced and have become more customer focused and are really pushing the, the boundary there to a greater extent than telecommunications so our vision here is that this uh, um, you know this disruption and this this huge level of innovation there's really two things that need to happen there one is that needs to be simplified um, in order to make the value of that innovation really come out. Um, and that is one area that, that um, uh, where artificial intelligence techniques can help. And the other area is uh, in terms of the opportunity that that, um, the opportunity that that brings in terms of providing new services. We believe that there is a real opportunity here for the telecommunications industry to become um, a kind of a, a service delivery platform for many other industries uh, and, and then not only transforming themselves,
but in the process also enabling the transformation of other industries at the same time. So I think there's a real golden opportunity at, uh, at the uh, current time for the telecommunications industry to achieve that. We're going to, in the following slides, we'll talk a little bit about the application of uh, artificial intelligence in different areas, status quo and future. Um, we probably won't talk too much about security, as that is a, uh, a probably worth a webinar in its own right. It's a large area and with a very specific um, application. So if we look at the use of artificial intelligence in the, in the radio network, first of all. So uh, radio network complexity is increasing. I think that's, that's not a surprise. Um, there are various statistics around, for example, that um, in a 2G base station, we might have had um, a couple of hundred parameters. And in a 4G base station, we have a couple of thousand parameters, uh, for example. Um, and that it is becoming increasingly hard to um, not only to configure and to plan networks like this, but then you know, particularly to optimize uh, the performance of those networks. And this is this is not going to this trend is not going to reverse in in the near time. If we look at the introduction of 5G um, with base stations with uh, you know phase array and, and smart antennas and uh, with a number of, of beams per sector, and what that is going to mean is that we no longer really have a sectorized coverage. What we're really going to do with that is we're going to try and emulate a sectorized coverage by steering and shaping beams to provide an equivalent level of coverage so that it feels like uh, we have the uh, ubiquitous coverage that we've got in, in other cellular technologies. This is going to become, um, this is going to add a new level of complexity over and above um, you know, uh, 3G and 4G that we've seen in the past. And so this, the network planning that, so, that comes with that and the, um, uh, yeah, the optimization and also um, other functionality that we know from self-organizing networks is going to become uh, uh, a real issue there. Also, uh, in 5G, of course, we're not only looking at um, the area of um, um, you know, enhanced mobile broadband, uh, we've also got IoT, and finally we have ultra-reliable low latency communications, which brings a whole new angle and a whole new dimension to this area. In the future, then, we're going to be looking at New techniques, for example, um, you know, capacity coverage planning, as I mentioned, with beam-formed antennas. Um, but then also the introduction of machine learning uh, technologies and advanced algorithms in a more, at a more detailed level as well. So we look at uh, more intelligent scheduling techniques um, that are being done, um, being looked into in order to be able to provide uh, a high level of quality of experience without having to use um, technologies uh, or techniques such as deterministic scheduling, which are really, how can I say, le less efficient and also not only less efficient, but they're also really hard to scale. If you have um, uh, you know, a, uh, um, a large number of buildings and, and factories and so on, and you tr you're going to network plan each one of those individually, that's going to require a huge amount of effort. So we really need intelligent um, techniques in order to apply that. Um, and then the final point as well, if we have as a vision that the uh, telecommunications network is going to become a service delivery platform um, for uh, you know, industries and society in general, we're also going to have to extend that service, or service orchestration into the RAN so that we can have application, application aware connectivity all the way through um, to the device. So it takes us on then to the next area, which is uh, service management. So service management, just to explain, uh, just a quick word on what we mean with service management. Um, you, I'm sure you've heard of uh, um, uh, operational business support systems, which give a view of the, let's say, the hardware of the, of the network and how the actual network is performing. With service management, what we're looking at is giving an, a view of, what, of the experience that the, actual, that the customer is actually experiencing. So that we can see, as the operator and and others can see, look at um, can see, you know, what is happening with the with the customer. Is that customer experiencing the kind of quality of service that they were they were expecting? They'd be paying for it and so on. Um, and um, this kind of technology has been around for some time. Uh, I don't believe it's been uh, very widely applied, more on a, on an aggregate or an abstract level. And it most definitely relies on um, uh, human in the loop um, kind of processes where if it really becomes apparent that something is um, um, you know, not working the way that it's expected to, that um, 
a decision can be made and, and an activity can be taken. So if we look at you know going forward, then how do we uh, you know what is the potential here? Well, with artificial intelligence, obviously the, the immediate potential is is to the introduction of predictive analytics and into this and predictive analysis, <coughs> um, so that it can be seen that in in future instead of uh, you know, just monitoring and, and seeing what kind of experience the, the customer is using. We can see, you know, if we can look at predictable pra um, traffic patterns that may be leading to congestion at certain times of day or congestion in certain parts of the network at certain times of the day or other type subscriber behavior, which is predictable, then we can reconfigure the network. We can perform more intelligent load balancing and other techniques um, in order to ensure that the um, that the, the the key parameter, I, which could be, for example, the quality of experience for a particular subset of customers, or the overall highest average aggregate quality of experience for the customer base as a whole, um, are um, it, you know, is achieved. Uh, if we then look at the um, uh, at the application level, um, which is you know, perhaps the, the kind of the, the highest end part of the um, of the telecommunications network as a as a service delivery platform. Um, here, there's uh, um, there's been quite a lot written in the in you know in the literature around different techniques here and the the kind of different aspects that need to be considered. But one thing that hasn't really been looked at, I don't believe in 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 too much depth, is actually you know how do you orchestrate the delivery of applications? On the one hand number of actors will say, yes, it's, it's fine, you put everything in the edge and we'll, we'll deal with it there. On um, the other hand, you have people who tell, say that, no, it's, you put it in the cloud and you deal with everything there. Actually, um, the question is a little more complex than that. And in this case, operators have got an opportunity to, um, and or flexibility that they can provide more, more focused implementations than others. Um, typically, if we're looking at a um, you know, high performance application, one where in particular, low latency response is, is required. It's easy to say, let's put it in the edge or in the device even, um, or uh, um, you know, in with with uh, a fog architecture, we can put it close to, close to the uh, to the edge. So this is very good. However, the, this is also a costly, generally a costly implementation um, to have something like this. So it's far you compute resource on a, on a commoditized level is far, is far cheaper far easily, uh, more easily accessible if you have that kind of compute level uh, functionality positioned in the cloud. So actually the decision about where to, where you want to uh, locate your functionality is really, um, uh, so it's more of an intelligent decision. So what is the latency requirement? Have I got a tight latency requirement? Then I need to maybe put the, uh, the functionality, the compute out further out in the network. However, if uh, latency is less of a requirement, um, and cost is a great uh, issue. Maybe I should put the, the functionality more in the middle. But there are other descriptions and, and conditions to be taken into account here as well. Um, the example I've just described might work very well for a, um, you know, an enterprise or an industry implementation. However, but what about um, if you've got a, uh, you know, a, um, an assisted uh, automobile, for example, where uh, you are driving along a road the edge compute, because you do want a certain level of, of low latency with the functionality, you put the edge compute um, in the network close to the car, and as the car is moving along, then the edge compute has to travel with the car along the route that it's um, uh, uh, the route that it's taking. And then other uh, issues come into um, come into question there. For example, the you know how much loading is there on, on is there on that edge compute on the the the, the uh, you know. The, the next stage compute in the in the track, um, what's the capacity of that? Uh, other questions like this. So actually, the the algorithm that is required in um, is is in fact uh, has a number of factors where cost and latency are uh, potentially the uh, um, uh, you know the, the most important uh, considerations in that. Or it could be the capability of the device and the capability and and traffic loading on the edge compute facility that you have there. If we look at the uh, um, core now, I think this is potentially the area where we have where we have uh, the most interesting aspect, and um, I believe the um, work is really kind of quite quite you know in the early phase here. 
So, um, uh, so how can I say the, um, the in the core network we we started with the with the shift from from um, you know vertical hardware oriented implementations I don't know, five five years ago or so towards a software based implementation, and this is starting this is increasing in um, you know momentum is increasing um, with now you know, larger and larger proportions of the network being taken up uh, and being put in a virtualized environment. Um, by no means is that that phase complete. Nevertheless, research is is pushing forward, and there there are a large number of um, um, initiatives here in terms of you know, managing that network level orchestration, looking at the use of um, uh, you know uh, network slices in 3GPP or even uh, service based architecture in, in um, terms of how to do this. There are also some technologies which are coming from the the cloud networking side of things, um, and intent based networking is is the most interesting one here, I believe, where you have um, the, the ability to abstract functionality out of the network and present it in a, in a more abstracted fashion to the overlying application or, or, or third-party layer as well. This gives a, a, um, a I think, a, a very interesting way of exposing network functionality to outside players and in terms of um, how you, uh, you know, if we're to position telecommunications network as a platform, for service innovation and, and transformation for other industries. Technologies like this uh, are, uh, should be considered um, in terms of exposing those network services. Uh, the final area, uh, I believe we have to talk about this when, we, when we're looking at the use of artificial intelligence, in, and that's in customer care. If we look at the use so far, um, and I think um, the, those um, you know, good progress has been made, Probably mainly in terms of, um, you know, in non-telecommunications areas, in terms of, um, you know, uh, making uh, product product predictions and, and you know, uh, um, essentially uh, nudging customers into a certain, you know, um, procurement or buying phase. But in really in the telecommunications space, it's been limited to to um, you know, uh, NLP-based uh, chatbots, um, which really, un I would suggest, are less there for um, giving an improved customer experience of the operator and more there for offloading um, the call centers and, and the high cost that that incurs. So, but really what we want when we're looking at um, the customer care is actually a bit more proactivity from the, from the customer care agent where you know, systems and services and, and applications and so on are, are auto-scaled according to your requirements. Um, you know, it's also not only gives you a better Quality of service. It also means that that um, you know in times when when you don't have such a high demand of the network on the service, you might actually that capacity could be used um, by other people. And there's certainly plenty of data in available from networks on which to base that kind of um, that uh, you know um, that kind of activity, whether it is on the consumer's uh, behaviour um, or other technologies or you know other um, telemetry that comes out of the network. Or indeed, other information. So, for example, in the use of uh, you know IoT devices, I think uh, probably most people in in the uh, in the world now are not only single subscribers to their, their telecommunication service, but they have a large number of devices connected um, to their subscription as well, which can be used. So, uh, I just want to go into um, a. Uh, uh, an example here, um, and it's the use of, um, you know, to do of um, ultra reliable communications, um, particularly in a manufacturing setting. We have executed a number of projects in um, to do with industrial IoT and manufacturing. So just want to go into that in a little. Obviously, and I think this is well known when you're talking about the control. Um, you know, uh, you can simplify it down into the communication of information from sensors and at the same time control information which is being sent to actuators. Obviously, the control information has a high um, requirement on reliability and on latency, um, and so if we're going to do that on a wireless mechanism, that ha we have to be sure that that works. It's not a 99% you know, it's, it's possibility, it's, it's many, many nines of reliability required there. If we look at the kind of traffic that comes from industrial IoT platforms though, um, we can see that there's actually a broad range of um, uh, applications that are there, and essentially it gives a pretty much similar spread of traffic types to that that we see in public networks, public cellular networks, where we have large file transfers, 
um, which have you know can be no effort, uh, not only not just best effort, but but no effort really just to get that across. Um, we have video streams which have a certain level of, of um, quality requirement, um, and then we have um, the control information for the control of robots and other industrial machinery, where uh, the amount of traffic, which is you know the, the packet size, is actually relatively small, but the reliability requirement, the quality of experience requirement, is extraordinarily high. So in that kind of setting, there's an, a number of things, and a, and a, a private uh, a network setting like this is, is an interesting case study for analysis because it's under the jurisdiction of a single company usually, and therefore is under control uh, of that individual company. But there are a number of other requirements, so reliability, resilience, um, safety is uh, is paramount, particularly when you have moving machinery. Um, we're looking very much at the at the safety of operators um, and you know, the safety of the machinery itself in certain situations. So we also have other requirements on those kind of networks. For example, here, uh, you know, uh, low latency, but also high density. If you look in a manufacturing environment, you can have extraordinarily high density of um, of connectivity devices. And I don't just mean um, the uh, sensors in that case. I also mean uh, high density of um, you know, machinery that needs to be controlled as well. So whereas in a, in a cellular network, we might be looking at, for example, I don't know, a number of hundred connected devices. In a, a industrial IoT environment, we're looking at thousands of connected devices per cell. So we need to be able to handle that. So in order to do this efficiently, what we're looking at is an intelligent way of managing the radio resources and network resources um, to provide the quality of service. And we want to do that efficiently. Deterministic methods or methods where we have uh, um, you know, rigid cell planning um, are hard to scale in that kind of environment. What you're really looking for is a system which will adapt itself and will optimize itself uh, in order to um, um, you know, not only offload the, the operator's organization, but also provide the quality of experience that we're looking for. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Monty. Thank you, Derek. Um, hello everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Monty Barlow. I run our artificial intelligence um, R&D and delivery capability. Um, one of the things I run is a dedicated research lab, um, which has to aim to be ahead of customer and industry need by perhaps two to three years for us to deliver genuine innovation. So whilst I can't talk about particular customer engagements, I'm going to show you some of the technology trends and capabilities that have been coming online um, in our labs and around the world recently. So by far the most boring slide to look at, the only non-visual one, um, but with a, a practical side to it, is that um, particularly in uh, many aspects of telecoms, but it's true in other sectors as well, um, the beautiful balanced data sets that AI needs for the results published in papers simply don't exist. Um, nobody wants to tell cats from dogs in photos with one million examples of each. They're looking to handle rare conditions or fraud or attacks or other problems, of which there may be very few um, recorded examples. Um, and yet, behind AI in this decade at least is machine learning and deep learning and what that does is it, it absorbs data and it spots the patterns. Um, so simple thing we can do today compared with normal deep learning in red, um, we can analyze data, generate more examples from that, train better systems and we can get a curve a bit like the blue one for example. Um, which means we can get better performance without having to run much bigger trials or much bigger data gathering exercises. Um, this can make the difference in a whole host of applications. Uh, but you're know, looking at something more practical, um, and I see a um, I'll come come. There's a good questions come back around Son. I'll, I'll come to that in a moment, but. Um, in increasingly software-defined architectures, it can be really difficult to tell the difference between the normal operation and bad operation um, because they're far more dynamic. So if we look at something 
towards 5G with far more devices and different mixtures of devices on a network, far more sort of heterogeneous um, operation. The difference between strange behavior because of Valentine's Day or a partial system failure inside virtual machines can be difficult. So we are um, using techniques around um, long short-term memory, recurrent neural networks, for those who like acronyms, um, but to diagnose complicated time sequences of metrics. So graphs that you might look at as a human being and say, I think there's something strange here. You know, the, the retry rate, the call dropped rate isn't doesn't look right compared with what's happening to server loading, but this has been traditionally really difficult for machines to deal with. This is now something we can do quite reliably and can automatically fuse data from a number of sources. And if you want a kind of lay analogy for that, we have demonstrated exactly that same technology telling the difference between Baroque and classical piano playing live which look exactly the same on an oscilloscope screen, but to that expert ear have quite different meaning. Um, but pushing onwards into yeah, very much the state of the art, it's now becoming possible as of the last two years or so to do better than humans in seeing through distortion on data to the truth that's um, behind it. Um, so not having to learn in difficult situations, but being able to make a judgment live as to what is just distortion or miscalibration and what is a true underlying change in what we're looking at. Um, we're exploring this for um, SON. There's a good question about where AI may reside um, in SON. Um, as an AI practitioner, I can say that the further up we put it, the more insight we can get across different parts of the network um, but there's a, also a kind of bandwidth between nodes questions that mean as always the more we can do on the edge the better so i think it's likely to be quite hierarchical with the complex optimization benefits at quite a high level in the core and local optimization um, nearer the ran but We've got a system here that I won't bore you with the kind of details of, but it really is able to form a mind's eye view of what is going on in data um, better than a human can. It's a big system. It spends days training in the, the biggest NVIDIA computers, um, but can then run real time. And I'd rather show you a visual example of this because I think it makes it um, clearer, but processing pictures is um, probably not the core application telecom. This is about spotting sophisticated patterns um, in data in, in underlying trends. So if you look at this picture here, it's pretty hard to see what's going on. Even if I tell you it involves um, an airport, um, it's at the level where a human vision system thinks it can see a few things. Um, we took a system trained on what airports typically looked like and it was able to recover by itself this image which is not exactly crisp or picture perfect but it shows the level to which artificial intelligence has come is that is now a clear enough image that you could in a vehicle avoid if you were driving on the runway you could avoid driving into a stationary plane and what we're saying is we can extract signal from noise, we can extract genuine trend from um, unfortunate day-to-day -day variation, now in a way that seems almost unreal. You know, you want to go test this because you think there must be some cheating has gone on. That's not how, you know, equalizers and normal kind of metrics work, but it is now possible. Um, or another example we like, another visual one, um, an aquarium that was filmed behind um, very distorting glass and the system automatically can take the image on the left and show the image on the right, um, generate it. Um, and these are pretty accurate. We know we've seen the fish. Um, so again, imagine that what your system is dealing with is heavily distorted, but you want a clear picture. Perhaps you want further 
AI systems to do the equivalent of counting fish, only we're wanting to count faults or look at the health of the system, the right-hand view is much more powerful, um, a much better input to such systems than the left. So there's rapid change happening in AI capability. Um, looking at the other end, you know, those are those are sort of systems that might typically run in the cloud or on on large edge compute. Um, we have a strong interest in making AI at the edge more possible. This is particularly interesting for a lot of IoT applications. Um, so we have an in-house technology called Sapphire. Um, the details don't really matter here, but it's about trying to get the best of both worlds. A hardware-like power efficiency, but with the ability to upgrade and flex and patch that we come to expect from the software world. So this enables our customers to spin custom chips, or ASICs that are tiny, they cost cents, um, and support very low power operation. You will have encountered one of these somewhere in your life. These are throughout smart sensors, satellite phones, you know, circuit breakers, all sorts of things. But to give you um, a couple of examples of where um, this is useful, um, sometimes we want to run those neural networks that promise so much, but in a um, local setting, you know, we're looking for, for vibrations in a machine or something, some indication we've got problems. Um, we can do classifications up to 10,000 times more power efficiently than most sort of incumbent silicon. Um, but another really good one is ultra low power voice detection. If you look up the Amazon and Google products, you'll find they have an idle power consumption of two to three watts. They're AI speakers, which is okay if they're connected to the mains the whole time, but that again rules out a whole load of IoT applications. So we're able to detect voice using just 11 microwatts permanently, and that gives us the um, ability to switch on more powerful systems only when somebody um, speaks. Uh, I see a good question, just picking the bottom one around, can deep learning models be trained at the edge considering the low resource? That's a really good question. Obviously, the, the broad answer is it depends. Um, there are ways of compressing data in a way suitable for later training. So we've done trial systems that are not exactly training at the edge, but they're using um, pre-done networks to decide what is worth keeping and discarding, and then they are backhauling the really useful stuff into the core, into the cloud to train with. So it, kind of a bit hybrid, but we're not literally updating the edge nodes in light of what's happening. And I think there's a lot of concern regulatory and otherwise about doing that, about systems that learn by themselves on the edge. I think that's going to come long after we have um, cloud-based training and careful um, rollout and deployment. Uh, just, just wrapping up, um, just mention that we are working with the, the big partners in this space. Um, you know, we're interested, we, we help say NVIDIA, um, customers who are training in a big way on GPUs, realize their sort of innovative dreams. We work with um, companies such as um, NetApp on how you make your on-premise and clouds compute work really well for these modern difficult AI um, training loads. And we're we're taking everything we know about IoT and telecommunications over um, actually decades um, and using that um, insight to help partition edge cloud um, systems with modern um, machine learning. Thank okay. you. So, okay, thank you, Monty. Um, just a few concluding words from my side then. Um, so we think there's a, a golden moment in the um, in the telecommunications um, domain here in order to um, transform from um, the current status into a more AI-driven, um, customer-focused um, service deployment platform. Think that there is a, not only can the AI enable that transformation to happen, it can at the same time manage the complexity that's coming into the network. 
Um, we think that, uh, in, that this also will enable a digital transformation of many of the other industries that depend on telecommunications or are going to depend on telecommunications in the future, um, which, which could well mean many of them. I mean, we can already see this, this shift from you know, um, I don't know, omni-channel or bricks and mortar companies over into cloud native companies and the competitive advantage that those companies have over more traditional ones, and then moving on to network enabled or network native companies in the future, um, which are then going to have uh, um, connectivity to to all of their customers. Um, we work in both in the on the strategic level in terms of advising people, but more importantly, also on the um, um, as Monty was describing here, on the development and research of new technologies and application of new technologies. Um, talk to us if you want to supercharge your organization with these capabilities. I'd be, there's some more questions that come up in the meantime. Okay. I'd be okay to take those now if, if that, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, Monty, so go ahead. There's a question, yeah, there's a question here about getting labeled. Data is a big pain. Yes, there is. Um, good question about can you do work with lesser labeled data? We do use semi-supervised learning sometimes the the GAN approach can it doesn't get rid of the need for labeling but it can make deep learning much more efficient at learning especially if one class is underrepresented so we have for example gone from 30 percent accurate to 90 percent accurate on the most problematic class using GAN based and semi-supervised approaches but there are some applications where the data just is not there or some customers we work with don't have enough and you know there's obviously only a limit to what we can um, what we can do um, there's a question about do you think using AI in the RAM will increase um, I guess that's end-to-end -end latency um, I certainly don't want to increase end-to-end -end latency I think you know that that's already problematic for a number of applications um, it depends what we're doing I think many early deployments of AI are going to sit um, next to established um, signal paths next to established um, communication routes and we'll be monitoring and possibly taking action I think we're a way off um, AI being directly in the stack layers, you know, inside the physical layer or, or routing through AI um, live as bits come from one radio to the next. At that point, there is a danger it adds latency, but I don't think that's going to be attractive. I think it'll be solving some problems, causing others, and, and the uptake will be slow. Um, the other question I can see here is comments about Google's TensorFlow Lite and its implementation um, as a sort of IC module for, for, for IoT Edge. Um, I could be being a bit cynical, but I think there's a desire because TensorFlow has become the, the sort of standard for learning, it's um, machine learning. Um, it's, for example, not what we're using now. We've had to move to PyTorch because TensorFlow is too limited in dynamic graphs and so on. But it's a really good way of getting started. So the world finds ways of driving that down into low power and embedded, a bit like you know, Arduino and Raspberry Pi and other initiatives get pushed quite hard. Um, Personally, that's not a mechanism that my team are using to achieve um, kind of low power IoT processing. Um, not yet, anyway. Oh, got another question. What do you see as the pros and cons for AI to implement network security actions based on threat analysis? Um, the area my team is working on this is actually about generating threat scenarios rather than taking action. So where the threat analysis tends to be quite rule-based today, and that's, that's okay, um, there's good reasons for that. Um, and that still counts as AI by 1990 or 1980 standards, but it's not maybe what we mean by deep learning. Um, and therefore, um, to date, all we have seen is ways of generating from perhaps you know 50 example 
um, threats have occurred in the real world, one million more viable looking threats and used for verification and validation as opposed to actually um, in the loop. I have no doubt it'll happen, and there are people claiming to use exotic AI, but with both colleagues who have moved from such companies and all the insight we have, we don't believe it's live and operational and doing anything useful today at least. Monty, thanks. I just, we have got some more questions coming in here. I would urge you all to, um, to get involved and ask the questions as, you, as they come to mind. Just, if I perhaps bring Derek back in for a moment and just switch you back to, to telecoms. I, I, and Derek, what, what's, what's your assessment really of, of the work that's been done in the telecoms market? You have talked about it variously and you've said that the others are pushing harder, but is, I mean, how would you characterize this market? Is it, is it, is it kind of a laggard or is it just not doing enough? I mean, can you, can you give me a kind of a, a sense of that? So I think there were a couple of questions there. So I think is the telecommunications market a laggard in the introduction of, of these new technologies? Well, in, in a way, James, it is, yes. If we look at, uh, um, I mean, the one which are potentially the, the furthest advance would be a uh, retail industry. If we look at how, you know, the things that, you know, you go onto, uh, onto an Amazon site and, you, you know, the, um, you know, in terms of, um, you know, product placement that they do there, um, in terms of, uh, you know, analysis of your behavior and, and making recommendations and things like this, um, I think they're, they're really very well advanced. And, and telecommunications has got every opportunity to do something similar and at the same time has not yet got there in order to do that. Um, so I think on, on that level, there's a, um, you know, it's, it's um, you know, for sure not one of the, uh, you know, in the leaders in that space. On the other, on, the, on a more detailed level, yes, there are a number of, um, you know, particularly in the research environment and looking at the use of artificial intelligence techniques for, you know, for radio network optimization, for channel characterization, for, you know, spectrum assignment, this kind of thing. There is, uh, you know, there's, there's work being done. To what extent that's actually been put into practice? I think that that is uh, um, that's more more limited. You know, there are examples, of course, on particular uh, applications that have been put into use, um, but I think there's still there's really a, a, a good deal more a long long way to go there. And just I wonder, I mean, Derek, again, I mean, on on the telecoms front, if if you know, if I am an operator and I'm looking at this, I'm wishing to engage mm. you guys, Cambridge consultants. What should we be coming to you with? What's the what are the questions? What is the what are the what is the focus? What should be our focus? Hmm. So really, <clears throat> really a number of different areas across the telecommunication space. Um, you know, it, we could um, you know the kind of questions that we'll be looking at are you know operator coming to us and saying, well, we're we're looking at streamlining our our operations. We we've got some idea about the application of artificial intelligence techniques. We don't really know what algorithms are most appropriate or we've tried it and um, you know the the amount of training data we need is is extreme how can we streamline that process um, that would be one one level of question the other is then you know what does it mean for the um, um, yeah uh, you know and I guess another point in that is not only looking at the technology and then how to implement it but but also you know how do we roll that out into our network how do we uh, you know, how do we change our technologies? How do we upgrade? And, and what does that mean for our employees as well? How does that you know, make their lives easier and make them more efficient in their work as well? Right. So, so there's also a, a in addition to the, the technology development aspect, there's also the, the more uh, strategic aspect there as well on how it how it you know can supercharge their business. Yes. Okay. And just there's a question here about. Um, Cognitive radios and and or spectrum optimization is this uh, is this something you're looking at applying your technologies to? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, um, do you want to take? Uh, so we we actually been working with uh, in this space for uh, well well over a decade. Uh, we've done uh, a number performed a number of projects into you know how to use spectrum more efficiently. I mean the, the current techniques that are used for um, assigning spectrum. Essentially, licensing or unlicensing are not the most efficient um, methods, and you know, and and then outside the cellular community, there's there are you know even less efficient techniques that are being used for for um, assigning spectrum. So, so really, the the issue here is um, you know, and and particularly as we move into our IoT and and private networks, is 
how can you use how can you squeeze more out of the spectrum that there is because you know as you know data data usage will for sure um, continue growing um, and you know we need to be able to to um, um, use intelligent techniques and not deterministic techniques in order to uh, really maximize that usage um, and then on top of all of that there's there's these uh, new technologies coming out like like um, you know um, beam steering and phase arrays and so on which are going to give you a, a, an additional dimension of using the available um, air interface and, and even network slicing so there's yeah. Derek says there's way more variables to, to handle now um, it's AI is not yet in physical layers. It's not yet adapting modulation rates and other things and encoding because that's you know that that's built up the way it has over many generations of standards and that would be quite a shakeup. But in terms of configuring resource, depend, deciding how to use spectrum when at what time, then um, yes, it is um, is becoming an increasing part of that and the sophistication with which we can do that is going up quite rapidly. Okay. Um, and so, just to get, uh, just to say again, we're we're taking questions. There's a Q and A dialog box, so so um, uh, far away. I've got another question here. Uh, does transfer learning really uh, is is it really possible in practical telecom scenarios? I wonder if if you have a view on that. Uh, yes and no is the honest answer. Um, a little bit, you know, it, it can buy the the last five, ten percent that you need. Um, but these uh, data transfer between one telecom application and another is difficult. Uh, this is what can frustrate people. They see papers published with amazing results of cats and dogs in them, and oh, that's fine because there are massive data sets and images always look like images, and it's not that easy really in the real world. Um, we have achieve that in some ways but actually um, pre-training networks on synthesized data um, and then retraining on what valid actual data there is is generally more effective than true transfer learning I would say I mean there, there was um, there was you know there was good examples in there with the with the the GAN example and the music the baroque classical example I just wonder can you yep. Talk about you know uh, you know translating the can you translate those into kind of real life scenarios a little bit to give us a, a sense of how they might apply apply this sorting you know signal from noise and trend from variation what that means sure. for telecom yeah okay settings yeah so uh, yeah the point about the telling musical genre is that the signals all look fairly similar especially if they're coming out of the same piano and it's the same player. Um, yeah, you look at them on a on a on a plot, and they look very similar. Um, and once upon a time, telling them apart would have been almost impossible for a machine reliably. For the first time now, with a few hundred only examples of each, we can reliably tell them apart to a kind of a human agreed level. And indeed, that's what your ear can do with a, a lifetime of of training. Well, that fluctuating signal over time. Um, yeah, looks exactly like some of the performance metrics we have got out of kind of infrastructure we've worked with. So things like your yeah, handover rates, dropped call rates, signal quality, those fluctuate up and down with uh, periodicity, a randomness. There are reasons why they change day to day or hour to hour that are good. Um, but the challenge is now with software-defined networks, virtualization, and so on, you know, when there's a failure, it can be quite complicated to diagnose. So a, a, a human staring at all those metrics might spot something unusual, having spent many days on the job, but machine learning has to date struggled with that. We can now use not just similar systems, exactly the same neural network we have applied to piano music genre telling who is who from their brain waves um, and detecting fault conditions um, in telecoms infrastructure does that okay. answer your question it, it does and i'm um, presumably that that goes into the industrial world as well into machine 
you know, machine uh, vision type scenarios and this kind of stuff. Is that is that correct? Um, yes, but I think you know, machine vision is quite well under well understood and intuitive in some ways. You know, spotting a fire um, in an IoT application with a camera instead of a heat sensor, that kind of thing. Um, there's much less discussion around dealing with non-visual signals because, well, that's not how people train in universities. It's all about images, usually in AI. Um, and I'm here kind of flying the flag for these more hidden approaches that actually do really useful things with in non-vision um, applications. Yes, yes, okay. And, and, um, and back on the telecoms front, there's a, a, a this yep. question about isolating network faults and, and how difficult that becomes. Is, uh, you know, presumably there's AI has a role there too. Uh, yes, it does, particularly where you're taking data from a number of sources and making quite a complex um, inference. Um, there's much touted areas like predictive maintenance, you know, I'll, I'll tell if a machine is about to break and, and that sort of thing. And often we find the business case isn't really there. You know, having a system that tells you that one function is going to fail it is you'd be better investing in a more reliable function in the first place. But the complicated problems that can happen um, because of virtualization and software definition um, you can use AI as an overlay now to catch quite complicated problems before they ripple too far. It is early stages, but that is something you know we are actively engaged in. That's okay. All right, and I mean, I just I guess to start to wrap things up, if there are any more questions, please please do ask. I mean, I wonder from you know you know zooming out again, Cambridge consultants, you know, you work with as you've talked about customers of every profile and, and you've seen this work through uh, develop um, what can you share some kind of best practice uh, for firms starting out down the road with this and, and equally uh, some things to watch for typical mistakes that might be made with this um, so well I think there's, there's a number of kind of kind of reasonably well-known areas I think one thing is it's um, it's uh, you know, there are a couple of things to do first of all in terms of getting data um, and how to um, you know data on which you can base your, um, your your machine learning. The second one then will be in which particular algorithm to use. So using so deciding in advance which algorithm to use is, is I don't know half art and half science. It's not a it's not a straightforward um, um, kind of logical process, and you need to have experience in order to know which you know which algorithm is most likely to give you the result that you're looking for. Um, with the other, you know, the externalities that you've got in that, you know, in terms of the amount of data that you that you've got available in order to, to use, and and um, it's often talked about, you know, um, when you're, you're training these these algorithms that you have, you know, clean, unbiased data with, you know, so that you're training them with what you think you're training them with, uh, as well. So those those are two kind of common areas of, um, you know, yeah. uh, of, that you really need to be aware of when you when you start off on this kind of activity. Yeah, I, I would just add. You know, push the envelope in in one place at once, but not two. You know, take a, a, a an exotic new technology from an industry where it's working, and a, you know, apply it to your application, or learn from what you already know in your application and push one stage further. But if you change too many things at once, and as you say, Derek, you haven't collected the right data, it's quite easy to end up with a research program that yields um, absolutely no return on investment. Okay, well, thank you very much. Look, I think that's the end of our session. That's the hour gone. Um, I'd just like to thank Derek and thank Monty. Um, one last reminder again, just to everybody who's, who's uh, still on the call, that uh, the session has been, record been recorded. It will be available. The slides will be available also on the RCR and Enterprise IoT Insights web pages. Uh, I would like to thank the panel, Dr. Derek Long, Head of Telecoms and Mobile at Cambridge Consultants, and Monty Barlow, Head of AI at Cambridge Con uh, Consultants. Thank you both very much. It's been a fascinating discussion. Uh, and finally, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us today. Thanks very much. <laughs>